With Update 1.1, World of Tanks is heating up. Well, what you heard is true. The new campaign of personal missions. Three operations with unique reward vehicles. A full Polish branch. New maps, Minsk and Stujanki, and much more. We start with the Polish tanks. Update 1.1 introduces 10 tanks from Eastern Europe. Starting the branch at Tier 1 is the 4TP, based on the Vickers Carden Lloyd. The 4TP has a choice of two guns, one with the auto-loading system and one with the traditional barrel. The latter boasts an alpha higher than most opponents of the same tier. Moving on, Tier 2 features the 7TP, a light tank with a good 40mm gun where the others have an alpha damage of 40. This pole has about 55, a DPM of almost 1,200, which is a real advantage. At tiers 3 and 4 are the 10TP and 14TP, respectively. These are still light tanks, but the transition to mediums is already noticeable. Both have higher alpha damage compared to their peers with rare exceptions. This is a common trait throughout the branch. Next in line is the 25TP, a tier 5 medium tank. Its key advantages are good speed, decent armor, and a great top gun. The average alpha damage is 135 with the same value of armor penetration. The pole can easily deal 1,620 damage per minute. The 40TP and 45TP Habiha sit at tiers 6 and 7. Unfortunately, neither of these made it to production. The models in the game were based on sketches made by a famous Polish engineer. The medium 40TP Habiha has a decent gun and armor. The average alpha is 240, making it a joy to play. 45TP Habiha marks a smooth transition to heavy tanks. The keyword here is smooth. By heavy standards, the pole's armor isn't that strong, but the gun and its alpha make up for that, 320 hit points. The armor penetration of 192 millimeters makes it clear to the enemy from the first shot that they are facing a heavy tank. High tier tanks, classic heavies. The 53TP Markovskigo is relatively slow but well armored especially the turret. Cast like the Soviets and boasting 210 mm armor in the front and 140 on the sides, which is enough to use the terrain to your advantage. This definitely complements the gun's minus eight degree depression angle, but gun depression is just half the story. The 53TP has a good spread and reload time. Couple this with 420 alpha damage and armor penetration of 218 millimeters and you get a great combination of characteristics in one tank. The last step before the top is the 50TP Tishkevicha. In terms of characteristics, this is the younger brother of the top tier tank, but among its peers, it stands out because of its alpha, 560 hit points in this case. Good armor allows you to play at the front, where there are so many enemies that you won't know whom to shoot first. The 60TP Lewandowska Go leads the branch from the top. This is a slow but well-armored tank that packs serious heat. But let's talk armor. At the front of the turret, you have 260 millimeters. Even better, the higher glacis plate is slow, and the lower armored plate is almost invisible. But the 60TP wouldn't be a pole if it didn't have admirable alpha, 750. Need we say more? You'll be able to use these specs to your advantage, as the 60TP is a jack of all trades. It can keep a front on lockdown, be on the edge of a breakthrough, and take a hit, or be present Predatory, looking out from behind cover and shooting its prey. After all, that's what gun depression is for. The Big Lewandowski is a universal soldier carrying the spirit of the nation. Polish tanks are paired with the Stujanki map. This is an open location with a lot of shooting from unexpected positions. It doesn't matter which tank you like to play most, everyone will find a role on this battlefield. Heavy tanks can rush to the factory or the village, supported by mediums. Light tanks will shine in the center and tank destroyers will work on the lit up enemies. Those are the most obvious moves, so it's up to you how to play it. Another new map appearing with update 1.1 is Minsk. This is the city where Wargaming's story began and development for World of Tanks started. 
The location in the game takes a number of liberties, but pretty accurately shows the central area of Minsk in the early 1970s. The city is in the midst of a training evacuation. The streets are empty, with helicopters rushing through the air. The map has several zones to attack. Apartments with dense buildings are suitable for well-armored tanks, as it's convenient to hide from artillery and pick off opponents one by one. The greenery has many spots for tank destroyers and light tanks. From here, you can fire on the square with the obelisk. This will help allies advance through the residential area. There are also houses around the circus, and medium tanks maneuvering between them can suddenly attack the enemy from behind. The map turned out to be large and varied, while still understandable. The main paths are clear. At the same time, those who love extravagant tactics will have their time to shine. With the update, Pilsen returned to the game, growing to one square kilometer. The changes can be seen immediately. You can see the area of hangars has expanded. On the one hand, there are more shelters and passageways, but on the other, the distances between them increased. Unlike before, taking the front quickly and safely isn't possible now. The eastern part of the map has changed completely. The coal embankments will serve as good cover for light and medium tanks. There is a shoot-through from the central hangar, but be careful and wary of tank destroyers close by. And remember you can use the railroad shortcut to get behind the enemy. Not only have new locations appeared, but well-known ones have also been modified. Here are the most notable changes on Glacier. The hill close to the aircraft carrier will now feature some cover. The shoot-throughs on the mountain have been balanced, and under the aircraft carrier, a stone has been added to provide cover. The Siegfried Line received its share of improvements, too. In the city, the house arches are now blocked by a pile of stones. A similar mound appeared on the same street a little to the left. Both flanks became more convenient to access for the top team. In C8, there is now a vantage point in the field for tank destroyers. From here, you can control the main escape routes from the city. And in E8, you can now drive up a hill in front of a ruined house. The pile next to the square will help when defending this area. Mines has also been adjusted as statistics showed that the top team had an advantage on the left flank. Balance adjustments are aimed at strengthening the lower team on this flank. Here's what's new. Modified cover on the small island now provides better protection. Positions for tank destroyers close to the base were improved. The stone ridge was lowered to add the possibility of cover. There's now a stone on the rise in the central part of the map. You can use it to overlook the islands. The spawn point of the lower team has moved closer to the islands and the center of the map. Province has received significant changes. After analyzing the statistics and your feedback, the battle tier limit has decreased. Now it will only see tiers 4 to 7. At the western base, houses have been rotated while coverage has been changed. Now players will be able to take cover from the top base's shoot-through. In the lower right corner of the map, additional cover appeared in the form of a stone. To reduce the number of draws and make the battle's end more dynamic, we've added shelter and adjusted vegetation around both bases. For more information on map changes, please check the portal. Good news for you Stronghold Warriors! In the near future, after the update, there will be an auto-selection option for teams and players. Now, in order to find a division, a legionary can simply choose a tank and click Battle. The commander's life will also become simpler. With the help of filters, you can choose a class of vehicle and even the specific machine of a potential ally. Auto selection will simplify the process of getting into platoons and forming divisions. The old method of manual selection will still be available. At first, auto selection will work in Tier 6 divisions, and during the war games, it will be available for Tiers 8 and 10. Saving the best for last. Update 1.1 opens the second front. This is a new campaign with personal missions. It has three operations. Not all will be available immediately. With the release of the update, only the first one will unlock. The next two will appear a little later. Keep an eye out for more details. Those who complete the first operation before the release of the second and the second before the release of the third will receive unique reward emblems. For completing each operation, in addition to the female tankers and camouflage schemes, players will be awarded with unique tanks. These are special vehicles with unique features and memorable names. Completing the first operation will grant you the British Tier 6 tank destroyer, Excalibur. Its looks are very recognizable, as it could be compared to a crumpled cardboard box. In addition, it's not the strongest vehicle, but don't judge it by its cover. The gun produces 150 damage per shot and reloads in 4.5 seconds. This feat of British engineering can dish out 2,000 damage per minute 
and this is Tier 6. The reward tank of the second operation is also from the British Isles. Meet the Chimera, a Tier 8 medium tank. The average damage is 440 HP, and the front of the turret is slightly thicker than 200 millimeters. The tank's name says it all. It's a real Chimera composed of several animals. In this case, it's different vehicle classes. There are traits from mediums, heavies, and even something from tank destroyers. After the last operation, the player becomes the proud owner of the Object 279E. Being a bit cocky in such a tank is forgivable. Firstly, you've passed all the missions. That's an honor. And secondly, just look at this big fella. How can you be modest with such a force under your control? At first glance, the 279E leaves more than track marks in battle. 330 millimeters of armor in the turret's front is more than the IS-7. Plus, there's no lower glacis, so that eliminates a weak spot. Average damage is 440 HP, armor penetration is 258 millimeters with AP and 340 with APCR, and reloading takes a little more than 10 seconds. This is a clear frontline fighter and it really opens up where you can hide the hull behind cover. The path to these machines is long and tough. In each of the three operations, the tasks are divided into groups, not by vehicle class, as in the first campaign, but by national allegiances. There are four of them, the Union, the Bloc, the Alliance, and the Coalition. Performing the tasks can only be done with the right national vehicles. The first operation is available to Tier 6 tanks and above. The second allows Tier 7 and above. The third includes Tier 8 or higher. Each of the three operations has its own conditions. In the first, your progress is accumulated. It can be accelerated if you perform an additional task. In the second, you need to achieve the goal in one fight. In the third, it's over a series of battles. If you are struggling with a mission, you can use an order to skip it. They are issued for passing the 15th mission with distinction on the second front. Please note, orders from the first campaign cannot be used in the new campaign and vice versa. Your live progress on the second front will be shown in battle and you can run both first and second campaign missions concurrently. And that's all. Try the Polish branch, study the new maps, and perform and persevere through the personal missions. Good luck in battle, commanders.